previously on our Jewish journey through the Gospel of John. You will remember I left you in suspense. I introduced Nicodemus, uh, and, and then I, I, I left you in suspense, but uh, I wanted to coordinate the story with what we have uh, today, this special holiday. Uh, just to remind you, Nicodemus is mentioned only in the Gospel of John, nowhere else, and just three times in the Gospel of John. He's a Pharisee, in other words, the, uh, the strictest of the religious sects, uh, but uh, the most popular of the religious sects uh, in uh, capturing the imagination of the people regarding what Judaism should look like. He is a member of the Supreme Court, the Sanhedrin, uh, the uh, most uh, important and impressive and learned and respected uh, leaders of the day, whether uh, Pharisees, made up of both Pharisees and Sadducees. And he is called, in the passage that we're looking at, the preeminent teacher of Israel. He is the preeminent teacher of Israel. Uh, apparently, he has quite a bit of wealth uh, because he's able to afford quite a lot of spices for Jesus' uh, funeral. Uh, and uh, we looked last week at the role of Nicodemus and John, and we took a little, a little straw poll, we took a little vote uh, as to uh, who thought he was a fearful secret disciple, who thought he was intrigued, he was sympathetic, but an uncommitted, ultimately an uncommitted observer, and uh, who uh, thought he was a committed disciple. So we had between the fearful and secret, the intrigued observer, and the committed disciple, we had a, a, a quite a variety of opinion, but we'll get back into the text here, and just to review those few verses that we covered last week. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, everything we covered in the chart. This man came to Jesus by night. We discussed the idea of night and what that means in John, what it possibly could mean. Uh, and uh, he said to, and remember, I want you to remember that um, what's recorded here in John is not the whole conversation. It would be very surprising if these uh, 10 verses that uh, they're interacting, 11 verses that they're interacting, is the entirety of the conversation. Uh, you can read these verses. You don't even have time for, to drink a cup of coffee, not even a half a cup of coffee, in the amount of time it takes to read these verses. So this is a very select uh, uh, choice vignette of this conversation, just an abridged version of the conversation with the highlights, because sometimes it doesn't exactly make sense uh, what one responds to the other, but let's continue. Uh, and he said to Jesus, Yeshua, Rabbi, recognizing that he is uh, a teacher, and uh, um, as the learned rabbi, the most res one of the most respected rabbis of his day, for him to uh, say, hey, collegial rabbi to Yeshua was very significant, but also remember what he doesn't say. He doesn't say, you are Mashiach. He doesn't say, you're a prophet. He does say, we know, in other words, me and my guys, uh, me and my, uh, my mishbucha back in the yeshiva, we know that you've come from God as a teacher. That's right now as far as Nicodemus is going to commit. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So he's not talking about uh, necessarily the chutzpah of Yeshua cleansing the temple and turning over uh, uh, tables and uh, money changes and driving it. Not talking about, talking about the miraculous signs that Yeshua has done. Now, John has only recorded the presto changer of the water to wine at this point, but nonetheless, there are still many signs that John is leaving out very clearly because he mentioned that there are signs that the people are believing in. Uh, in fact, they're believing in Yeshua because of his signs and his authority because of the signs, not necessarily because of what he's teaching or who he is. Anyway, no one can do these signs. So it's curious. So let me uh, see what I can uh, find out. No one can do these signs that you do unless God is with them. So Jesus answered, Yeshua answers, and this is where we left off. Truly, truly. Now remember, truly, truly is the amen, amen. And what does amen signify? I'm putting you on the spot right now. What does amen signify in a normal prayer or in a normal statement? Maybe, right, right, exactly. Maybe so, maybe, right? And Yeshua is the only person uh, that we know of in the history of, Jewish, uh, of the Jewish people who actually front loads the may it be amen that you'd stick at the end to say, hope so. Um, he front loads 
his statements with the amen. And in other words, what I'm saying is so certain that you can take it to the bank. And in John, we get not just amen, we get amen, amen. We get a truly, truly, a verily, verily. Uh, um, bank on this, bank on this. Count on this, count on this. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again in the text here, the term is anothen, he cannot see the kingdom of God. First, we talked about the kingdom of God last week. We talked about what the kingdom of God is. The kingdom of God is a future age, a millennial age, a thousand-year reign, a 1,000-year messianic kingdom when the Messiah will reign from the throne of the house of David uh, on the throne of his father David from Jerusalem, and Israel will be the chief of nations and the world will see peace. So, messianic age. So, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So it would behoove us to understand what is meant by the term born again. Um, the problem is, uh, the problem is that the word anothen has two meanings. It can mean born again, or it can mean from above. So the question that the interpreter of the passage has to read is, does Jesus mean to say, unless one is born again, whatever that means, he cannot see the kingdom of God? Or does he mean to say, unless one is born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God? What are you going to do when you have a word which can go both ways? And even the, uh, the Aramaic, uh, the, the term underneath this, goes both ways. It's a double entendre, it's a double meaning. So... We see why Nicodemus interprets it the way he does. Because when the Jewish people think of the world to come, the messianic age, if you will, um, they believe, at least as recorded in the oral tradition, about 200 years committed to paper, to, uh, to uh, uh, writing, about 200 years after the time of Jesus, uh, the Jewish people believe that all Israelites have a share in the world to come. In fact, we read that last week, and in fact, we read the follow-up to that verse, except for those who don't believe that the Torah is coming from heaven, uh, except for those who say the, the sacred name out loud, except for those who pray for the sick and expect that they will be healed, i.e., those who read from uh, unorthodox uh, books, scrolls, i.e., Christians. Uh, lots of Jews don't have a share in the world to come, uh, uh, but... Unless you were one of these big sinners, by virtue of being Jewish, you would see the kingdom of God. So there is no qualification, in other words, the only qualification that Nicodemus knows of when talking about seeing the kingdom of God is being Jewish. That's why we see being children of Abraham such a big issue in the Gospels. And while John the Baptist, remember him, Johnny B., uh, he says, hey, uh, don't think that just because you're children of Abraham, you're going to be okay, because God can, I tell you that God can raise up children of Abraham from these stones. Right? So they're trusting in their ethnicity. They're trusting in their culture. They're trusting in their DNA. But remember what Jesus said, Yeshua said, I say to you, truly, truly, unless one is born anothen, again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Nicodemus, here's the answer right, that he gives. And again, his presupposition is that I'm Jewish, and I'm a big shot rabbi, I'm a macher, right? Do you know who I am? Of course you know. You know. Do, you, do you know me? Uh, and of course he's going to see the kingdom of God. Who else? Who better? But Nicodemus said to him, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born. Can he? Now, you hear a lot of messages over the course of, uh, of, uh, of uh, reading through John. A lot of, I want to point out how, well, how obtuse Nicodemus is. Okay? Does he really think that Jesus is telling him that he needs to crawl back in his mother's womb and be born again as a, uh, and go backwards and be like a Benjamin Button of some sort? Uh, Nicodemus is not thick. He just understands that that's an absurd term. If, if it's to be understood, as Nicodemus does, which is to be born again, that's absurd from Nicodemus' position because all Israelites 
have a share in the world to come. All Israelites will see the kingdom. So I think he's being not obtuse here. He's talking like a rabbi. He's playing. This is a verbal joust going on between Nicodemus and Yeshua. How can a man be born when he's old? Are you saying to me, in other words, that I'm supposed to enter a second time into my mama's womb and be born a second? How absurd is that? Surely you're not saying that, right? What are you getting at, Yeshua? What's your point? Remember that uh, the same oral tradition tells us that uh, there is a category, it's a loose category of being born again. Um, I, I've heard some teachers say that this is uh, understood as being born again in Jewish uh, theology. Not exactly. Um, legally, uh, a Gentile who uh, converts to Judaism is, for the sake of the law, and for the sake of his previous legal status as a lawbreaker and a sinner, as a, as a goyim, as a Gentile, as a goy, um, a proselyte is classified for legal purposes as a newborn baby. The Jewish people are not talking about as some kind of ontological change that uh, uh, the, the individual is actually undergoing a physical DNA change. Um, it is a legal status. Okay, so uh, he gets, in other words, he gets a clean slate if he becomes a, if he attaches himself to the Judaism, uh, to the to the Jewish faith. Uh, so there is kind of a category of being born again. Um, and, but obviously, Nicodemus, as a rabbi, is, not, is a Jewish rabbi, not a Gentile, not a convert, not a proselyte. He doesn't fit this category. So the question for us, does Anathan mean born again or from above? And the problem for many of us is that our translations all read born again, and our culture, ever since Jimmy Carter uh, uh, did the interview in Playboy in 1975, uh, 1976, you know, and said, I'm a born again Christian. Um, everybody understands this term, born again. It's the big, it's big term, and we dare not change that. We dare not actually, even though the text may actually indicate something else, we dare not translate it any different than that. But really, when we're studying the text, what does it actually mean? What is Yeshua? would say. And the only way, the, the best way to discover and to determine whether this means born a second time or whether it means born from above is to look at the other uses of anathen by John within the gospel. And it's used four other times in, <coughs> in the gospel. Uh, and so, or four times in the gospel. And 331, later on in this chapter, he who comes from above is above all. He who comes from heaven is above all. All. So you have anothen above. How ridiculous would it be to read he who comes from heaven is again all. Uh, he who comes from above is again all. The make any sense. Uh, next passage, 1911. You would have no authority over me. This is Yeshua speaking to uh, uh, Pilate. Um, not the driver of the plane, but the governor of, uh, of uh, Judea. Uh, unless it had been given to you from above, not from again. That would make no sense. From anothen, from above. And then, of course, the tunic in the same chapter. They took Yeshua's tunic, which was seamless, wove it in one piece from the top. From, not from again, but from the top. So every other time that anothen is used in the Gospel of John, it is from above. And we spent a lot of time, a lot of weeks, in the prologue, discussing <coughs> John laying out his terms, setting the overture of the show that was about to unfold, the play that was about to unfold, and we know that that the word comes from above, enters into human history. He comes down, he condescends, he comes down from above. All of Yeshua's uh, references to Son of Man, <coughs> the apocalyptic figure, Barinash of, uh, of Daniel 7. Nonetheless, we have to make a determination. Now, Nicodemus heard this, and he said... Uh, Mandarish, I think it is in Aramaic. Anyway, um, Nicodemus hears this and he hears again. But this, I think, is one of those examples of Yeshua saying one thing that is meant to be understood one way, but actually meaning something else that the reader, and only the reader, only the disciple, only the follower of Yeshua will actually pick up after the fact. 
So here we have Nicodemus, and he's trying to decide, um, are we talking about born again? In other words, going backwards. Are we going backwards for a second birth? Or are we now, are we going forward? Does Jesus mean to go forward to have a, a new birth, a new identity, an identity that is from above? An identity from above. And now the next verse that Yeshua shares sheds some more light because it's parallel to what he just said. Unless you've been born again or born from above, born anothen, you will not see the kingdom of God. Now we have truly, truly, second line, truly, truly, amen, amen. I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Enter into is just another way of saying see the kingdom of God. He's not making a second category of those who can see the kingdom of God and those who can enter the kingdom of God. He's just simply parallel saying the same thing in another way so that Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel, might catch a clue as to what Yeshua is saying. So Water and the Spirit. Unless one is born, it was hard enough to determine whether it was born again or born from above, but now... You have to be born of water and the Spirit. Oh, that's troubling. And you know what makes it more troubling is the English translation, which includes a, an article, the, um, and a capital S, which is, article, the, is not in the text. So it's born of water and Spirit. One preposition, two nouns, water and Spirit. Of Water and spirit. Not water and the spirit, but sometimes our translations, they try to help us, but it makes things a little bit, they want to lead us by the hand, but they lead us into a misunderstanding of the passage. But let's, because entering the kingdom of God is very important. I want to make sure I have a future with Yeshua. So what does it mean to be born from water and spirit? Well, some would say that <coughs> water, what water, um, that has to do with the, uh, the birth process. That's a birth process. And, and they can show you, like, for example, um, that water is a euphemism for uh, physical birth, i.e. the male uh, liquid uh, plus the female liquid, like we see here in Proverbs 5, drink water from your own cistern, fresh water from your own well, speaking of your wife, by the way, should your springs, speaking of you, speaking of your stuff, guy, should your springs be dispersed to broad streams of water in the streets, let them be yours alone and not for strangers with you, let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth. So both male and female um, reproductive uh, uh, components spoken of in a liquidy sense, in a water sense, okay, as a euphemism. So some might say that, well, we're talking about physical birth, okay? Or, or maybe even, there's no scriptural uh, support for this, but they want to say amniotic fluid, right? We all say, hey, did your water break? Must be talking about that. There's absolutely no evidence in any Jewish literature anywhere at any time or in the scripture at anywhere at any time where the amniotic fluid is called water. Or in, uh, no. But then you have that next verse, which we're going to go back to this next verse, but this next verse uh, seems to be saying that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. It does seem to be saying that you have a physical birth and they have a spiritual birth, so maybe water is uh, speaking of physical birth. So we get to this little chart here. Uh, what does it mean to be born of water and spirit? And choice number one, which I've just shown you, is physical or natural birth. And then plus supernatural or spiritual birth. So uh, water, physical, natural birth. Uh, spirit, spiritual, supernatural birth. Or if you don't like that, perhaps because we've been spending so much time with John the Baptist and the baptism for repentance, we might be talking about uh, John the Baptist's uh, baptism, a baptism according to John the Baptist, the re baptism of repentance. That gives you your wet, your water, um, plus the spirit, spiritual or supernatural birth. But John the Baptist, while he plays a very important part 
in the first chapter uh, is going to play less and less of a role and in fact is soon to disappear in the narrative completely, it would be very interesting and certainly Nicodemus, uh, we wouldn't be uh, teaching that you have to go through John's baptism uh, to enter the kingdom of God. That makes sense. Well, okay, well then some would like to say, well, well it's Christian baptism. Christian ba you ha because you have to be baptized to uh, have a future with the Lord, right? That's, that's how you wash away uh, your sin. And so Christian baptism, that gets you wet, a little, whether it's a little dab that'll do you as a baby or whether you dunk, uh, either way, um, you get the wet baptism and then you get the supernatural birth. So you get a, you get Christ But Christian baptism here is an anachronism and while John's readers, after the fact, they'll know about Christian baptism, Nicodemus wouldn't have a clue about that. That doesn't make, make sense at all. Um, well, but we just talked about the water and wine, and, uh, and uh, he used the, the Jewish purification vessels. And so maybe we're talking about, unless you go through Judaism, and the, the purifications that are necessary to be uh, uh, compliant with the Jewish faith, um, so you need Judaism, and you also need a spiritual or supernatural birth, then you will see. But that doesn't make any sense because that would then say that before you can become a Christian, you have to be Jewish. And I have an entire New Testament that argues against that point and a specific book, Acts, uh, and a specific several chapters where that's very, very clearly discussed, uh, plus Galatians, plus Hebrews, et cetera, et cetera. That doesn't make any sense. So sometimes you go back and you say, okay, well, I've exhausted all my possibilities. What does the actual grammar tell me? And again, when you have one preposition that is governing two nouns, right, that are linked with an and, then that is the same. So water equals spirit. Well, can you prove anywhere in the Gospel of John where water and the Spirit are the same? Yes, I can. We'll get to chapter 7. We've done this before. I preach this every time we go to uh, Sukkot and Tabernacles. Every time that comes up, we look at John chapter 7, and Jesus says, you want living water, by which he means the Spirit, you have to come to me. So yes, absolutely, in just a few chapters, you will have water equaling the Spirit very, very clearly. Of course, later in the New Testament, Paul uses this euphemism as well, uh, the linking the water with the Spirit. But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us not on the basis of deeds which you have done in righteousness, here's what the action is, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. The water, the washing, the changing of our hearts, the changing of our lives into a new creation is the regeneration that is done through the Holy Spirit. So there's a New Testament example. I don't want to spend too much time in, uh, in Pauline theology. I do, however, want to go back to the Hebrew Bible. Remember, Jesus is speaking with the teacher of Israel, and so surely there are some Hebrew Bible passages that Nicodemus should have known and seen a connection between water and spirit. Remember that this John is not a low context book, but a high context book, high context book, which requires a, if you're going to actually understand everything that's in it, requires a certain level of familiarity, literacy with the Hebrew Bible, or else you miss a lot of the allusions, you miss a lot of the quotations, you miss a lot of the pictures. And the wordplay that Yeshua is sharing. Now, let's look at this Isaiah passage, Isaiah 44, 3. Famous passage. Again, this is one that comes up every time we do tabernacles, Sukkot. For I will pour water. I will pour out water on the thirsty land, streams on the dry ground. Hebrew parallelism. The water is parallel to the spirit. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring that is parallel to the thirsty land. My blessing streams on your descendants, the dry ground. So here we have a very, very clear and a famous passage, Isaiah 44, 3, pouring out water and streams equaling the spirit on the offspring, on God's offspring, okay? But... Here's one for those of you who were in Richard's class this morning. Surely you remember, because this played a very large role 
in his teaching this morning. Um, and it indeed, not just in Richard's teaching, but it plays a large role in our understanding of the prophetic future period. Whether we're Jewish or whether we're uh, uh, Christian, this is, uh, or, or Jewish Christian, like some of us. Um, but I will spring, then rather, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Famous passage regarding the future in the new covenant. Moreover, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you, removing the heart of, of stone from your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. So we have spirit and water together in Ezekiel 36, 25, or 27. That's a passage for sure Nicodemus should have known. And it ends here, I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. You will be careful to observe my ordinances. So water and the spirit linked together in Isaiah. Water and the spirit linked together in Ezekiel. Nicodemus, the preeminent teacher of Israel, how do you not see this? How do you not know this? Well, Jesus continues, that which is born of flesh is flesh. So maybe all you understand is stuff regarding the flesh. And maybe this is a little above your head, uh, double entendre intended, right? That which is born of spirit is spirit. So don't be amazed. Don't be, don't get yourself out of all sorts. But I said to you, you must be born from above. From above. You can still use born again, by the way. I'm not telling you that born again is not a biblical idea. Because Peter uses it twice in chapter 1 of 1 Peter. He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Because you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. So you have new birth, and you've been born again. Except Peter doesn't use the term anothen. He uses a different word. Okay? He uses the word for generated again. Okay? Born again, literally born again. So when we see anothen, it's born from above. So I'm not telling you chuck born again. Don't chuck born again. That's a good term. But it's not the term that Jesus uses here in John. And that brings us back to the prologue. Verse one, uh, chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. But as many as received him, to them he became the right to become, he gave the right rather, to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man. Flesh is flesh. That which belongs to flesh is flesh. But that which is a spirit is a spirit born from above, changed by the Holy Spirit, renewed by the Holy Spirit. Not born from below, born from above. People ask me where I'm from all the time. You probably get that asked ask that all the time. Um, as well. Everybody gets asked that term. But I speak a lot, so people want to know where my uh, unique uh, blend of accents uh, uh, generates from. Uh, and I tell them I'm, uh, I'm Brooklyn. I'm from Brooklyn. Uh, and uh, your origin often uh, uh, determines your identity. So uh, on one level, yeah, you know, you can take the boy out of Brooklyn. I've been gone from Brooklyn since I was almost 12. Uh, I'm born from, gone, gone from Brooklyn, but you can take the boy out of Brooklyn, but you can't take Brooklyn out of the boy. Right? And my Brooklyn heritage has a very large determiner of my identity, in fact, so much so that my first like, decade here in Texas was, was challenging because, uh, you know, we're pretty straightforward in Brooklyn, and, you know, that was a little bit of a culture shock here, and people would say, oh, Steve, you're, 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 you're too abrasive. Steve, you're too, uh, you're too abrupt. Steve, you're too, you're too, you're too Brooklyn? No, Jewish. No. <laughs> that, that too. But the point being is that if we are born from above, if we are children of God, born of God, and we have that right because we have received him by believing in his name, then our identity is new. 
we're born from above. So yeah, in one sense, yeah, you're from Brooklyn or you're from uh, Tennessee or you're from uh, California or wherever, or you're from Dallas. What? But if you follow the Lord, if you're a follower of the Messiah, you're born from above through the Spirit. Jesus continues, the wind. And he used an illustration which so many people are like, okay, it's an illustration that doesn't really speak to me. I'll tell you why it doesn't speak to you because you don't know the Hebrew Bible all that well. Uh, the wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Jesus is giving Nicodemus another clue. Saying, okay, here's an easy clue for you, okay? Using like Ecclesiastes, Kohelet 11.5. Just as you do not know the path of the wind and how bones are formed in the womb of the pregnant woman, birth, wind, so you don't know the activity of God who makes all things. But to make it even easier, let's go from Ezekiel 36 to 37. Ezekiel 36, talking about my spirit, uh, allied with water. Now, in 37... It's the spirit with the wind. Ezekiel 37, 9 through 14, he said to me, prophesy to the breath. This is the valley of dry bones. Prophesy, son of man, say to it, this is what the Lord God says. Breath, wind, ruach. Same word. It's a word play. In Hebrew, as well as in Greek, wind, spirit, breath, means the same thing. Okay, we're talking about pneuma in Greek or uh, uh, ruach in Hebrew. Breath. Come from the four winds and breathe, or wind, come and breathe into these slain so that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me. The breath, the wind, the spirit, the ruach, entered them. And they came to life. Them bones, them bones, them dry bones, and the bones connected to, right, everybody, you know the words. Uh, and the breath entered them. They came to life. And they stood on their feet, a vast army, and he saying, came to me, son of man. These bones are the whole house of Israel. I will put my spirit in you. Wind. Spirit. And you will live. And I will settle you in your own land. The prophets illustrate the spirit by use of water, by use of wind. Jesus is not doing anything beyond what the prophets have done before him. But again, the wind blows where it wishes. And you hear the sound of it. You don't know where it comes from, where it's going. You can't control the wind. You can't understand the wind. So it is not of the Spirit. It's not saying you can't control the Spirit. That's not the point of the passage. The point. So is everyone who is born. In other words, people who are born from above. The world will not get them. You do not know where it comes from and where it's going. The world will not get you. If you are born from above, if the Spirit of God has changed you, has regenerated you, has made you a new creation, if you are born again, because you're born from above. If you're born anew, in other words, the world's not going to understand you. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus said to him, humana, humana, humana. Uh, Jesus said, uh, Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Not, I don't understand your words, but I don't understand these new categories you are giving regarding my relationship and the Jewish people's relationship to God. You're blowing my categories. How can these things be? Or as its translation be translated in English, what you talking about, Willis? Uh, what? <laughs> My categories are completely blown. And Yeshua answered and said to him, Are you the preeminent teacher of Israel? And you do not understand these things? If, if, if you're the best that Israel's got, it's going to... Right. I'm glad we're only in chapter 3 because i got a lot of work to do. Right? Uh, you, you are the preeminent teacher teacher. You are the, the grand master. You are the, the Jedi master. And you come to me and say, huh? How can these things be? Right? We have a disconnect here, Jedi master. And here we get another amen, amen. Amen, amen. Jesus says, truly, truly I say to you, 
We speak. Who's we? Was Jesus speaking the royal we? Well, some people think that it's uh, Jesus and the Father. No, I think he's just calling back to Nicodemus saying, I represent a group. My, 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 my mishpucha and I, well, she was saying, I represent a group too. My mishpucha. We speak of what we know. And we testify of what we've seen, but you do not accept our testimony. And now, while the passage continues, this is the last we see of Nicodemus. Nicodemus doesn't come back. And he, I mean, he's still there, but Jesus is about to lay a whole lot of theology on him, which we'll take care of next week. Uh, if I told you earthly things and you don't believe, what earthly things did you just tell? Well, how to be born from above. Well, that sounds like it's spiritual. No, that's basic. This is what you're going to understand now. If I tell you spiritual things of the heavenlies or of the future or of the kingdom of God, you're not going to get that. i got to tell you how to get in. You're, you're not even in. You're not, you, don't have, you don't have a ticket to ride yet, right? You're still reading the brochure. If I told you earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? And that brings us to our holiday today. Spirit of God that is so important in regenerating and renewing. Jews, and we find that later, non-Jews as well, all by the same means through believing in Yeshua by receiving him. We wind up at Pentecost, at Shavuot. Now, traditionally speaking, as a Hebrew Bible, it has nothing to do with the Spirit. Uh, on uh, on uh, Shavuot, uh, weeks, Deuteronomy gives us this passage, you shall count seven weeks for yourself. Uh, week uh, is uh, uh, Shavuot, seven weeks, uh, you have seven uh, weeks, plural, Shavuot, right? For yourself, this is count seven weeks from the time you begin to put the sequel to the sickle to the standing grain and say the feast of the weeks to the Lord. Hag uh, uh, Hasukot, right? Um, to the Lord your God with a tribute of, in other words, it's a pilgrimage festival when the Jewish people are commanded to come to the central location of worship, which eventually was originally the tabernacle, is now the temple, the time of Yeshua. And of course, the Leviticus passage that we see here. You shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath. In other words, the Sabbath of Passover week, which is a previous passage. From the day you were brought of the sheep of the wave offering, first fruits. There shall be seven complete Sabbaths, and then count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. So seven weeks, 49 days, and then the 50th day, boom, there's a holiday. So if you're going from Sabbath to Sabbath to Sabbath to Sabbath, it's seven weeks, and then one more, or one more day, and you get to a Sunday, right? Boom. That's, uh, that's how it's presented in the Mosaic Code. You appear before the Lord. Give me an offering. But over time... The Jewish people, as they moved from a life that was regulated by the rhythms of a rural culture, an agricultural culture, into a more of a cosmopolitan culture, a more citified culture, where the, uh, the barley harvest was Passover and the wheat harvest at Pentecost seven weeks later, those harvest cycles became less and less important and practical in their lives, the rabbis began to teach that, well, the law was given at some point, and in proximity to this particular uh, date, and it doesn't say exactly when the law was given, at Sinai, and it's close enough, so let's combine the two, and we get one-stop shopping, and what was just originally a rural and a pilgrimage holiday becomes now a theological holiday to celebrate the giving of the law at Passover time. The Zaman Matan Torah Tenu, the season of the giving of the Torah. And there are special, uh, special uh, foods and customs that the Jewish people have today for Pentecost. Uh, and those are very interesting, but I've posted a lot of that uh, on our uh, 
Facebook page. Interesting, very interesting. We read the Book of Ruth. Uh, we uh, have all-night all uh, uh, Torah studies for those uh, who, can, who can stay up. Uh, we do all kinds of things. We eat a lot of dairy. Uh, if you've read our face, you, you know all of this already. We know all of this already. The main passage, however, that's read is Exodus 19 and 20, the giving of the law at Sinai. That's the main thrust of the holiday as it's celebrated today. Now, we spent eight months in Exodus, so I know that you have a very fine grasp of, uh, of the giving of the law and understanding what that means. But you may not have as firm a grasp on the sequel on the sequel to the giving of the law, which occurs 1,500 years later, Acts chapter 2, the celebration of Shavuot, Pentecost, in the temple, uh, in the temple compound, in approximately the year 33 AD, give or take a few years. Okay. Where everyone is called to gather, including the apostles, including the early everyone, if you were Jewish and you were in Jerusalem, which we know the apostles were, and indeed they were both, they would have been in the temple precincts on the morning of Shavuot. Crowded. It's one of the pilgrimage, Pentecost, uh, Passover, Tabernacle, three pilgrimage festivals, right? So wherever you were in Israel, or even from outside, in the diaspora, in the world, you came to a pilgrimage festival, if you could, if you could, by any means possible, you can. And Luke tells us in Acts chapter 2, verse 1, now you'll see I added a word because I don't like the NASB's uh, translation. Um, when the day of Pentecost had come, uh, as if it's just a, hey, let me tell you, this event's, these happened on Pentecost. No, that's not what Luke is saying. Luke is using a, a specific word, which means that when the day of Pentecost had fully come, in other words, the fulfilling day of Pentecost, the day that Pentecost, the day of Shavuot, the 50 days, the seven weeks, this holiday, becomes fulfilled, is what's coming down, is what I'm going to tell you about. Here is how Pentecost is fulfilled, according to Luke. Colon. They whose day, the previous referent, is the apostles. Uh, and suddenly they were all together in one place where they're going to be in the temple courts. And suddenly they came from heaven. A noise, like a violent rushing wind. Whoa. We have... Now, don't mistake this. It's not a wind. It's a noise. Like a wind. It's not a wind, right? Nobody's all of a sudden saying, boy, did it get chilly all of a sudden. No, they're saying, I heard something. It's a sound. But what was the sound like? Like the wind. Now, we've already seen the wind here today. We've seen the wind, and the wind indicates often, not all the time, but oftentimes, can indicate the spirit. Should get your attention. So a noise like a violent rushing wind. And it filled the whole house where they're sitting, the whole temple court where they are, the whole habayat. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire. Not fire. It's not fire. It's something that looks like fire. It's as of fire. It's not fire. It looks like fire. How can I describe it? Best thing I got, fire, says Luke, right? There appeared to them tongues, as of fire, distributing themselves. Two for you, one for you, a few for you, right? Uh, all the way across, okay? All 11, uh, 12 apostles. And they <coughs> rested on each one of them. And they were all filled. Now here comes what we would expect if we were familiar with the prophets, as we've seen already today. And they were all filled with the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. Now this is for a point. They're because this is a pilgrimage festival and there are Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven, and when the sound occurred, the crowd came together. It's got their attention. There's a sound. I don't feel a wind, but I hear one. Right? I'm paying attention. And they saw the fire, but it's not a fire, so they got their attention. And the crowd is bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. Now remember, the miracle is uh, not called ears. It's not the, the gift of ears. This is the gifting of tongues. The miracle is in the language, not on the, not on the ears of the hearers. It's in the language that the apostles are speaking. But Peter is going to make a, a speech since he's got everybody's attention. Peter, taking a stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared, I'm picking and choosing. 
uh, passages. But this is what was spoken of. In other words, what you're seeing now is what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. There is a correspondence between what Yoel said and what you're seeing here. And it shall be in the last days, God said, that I will pour forth my spirit on all mankind. It's an amazing thing how often you see um, in the Hebrew Bible the idea of the spirit being poured out by God, like water. Right? The association of pouring, as if it's a spirit of God, it's not a substance. Okay, so don't, but that's the metaphor that's used, that God uh, treats the spirit uh, uh, like water and pours it out. I'll pour forth my spirit on all mankind. So men of Israel, going forward now, skipping now to verse 22, 25, 31, 33. Men of Israel, listen to these words. Here's the point of everything here. The point is not that, look, we can speak in different languages, okay? Looky, looky, you know, I can speak, uh, even though I'm a Galilean, and you can still hear my Galilean accent. It's like a Brooklyn guy. You still hear a Brooklyn accent, even though he may be trying to speak French, right? Still going to be French with a Brooklyn accent. All right, so too um, is going to be uh, with, a, uh, with a Galilean accent. But men of it, this is not the point. Jesus, of Naz Jesus the Nazarene, a man attested to you by God, how? With miracles and wonders and signs which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourself know. In fact, remember, that was what John is telling us in the previous chapter, chapter 2. John is that's what's getting everybody's attention. That's what's, what's getting all the excitement, the signs, the miracles, the wonders that you should. So they knew about that. They didn't, know the, they didn't buy into the significance of what the signs, the miracles were authenticating. The fact that he was a messiah. But anyway, just as you yourself know, this is familiar stuff. It's what he's famous for. Going on. Or David. King David of King David fame. Um, for David looked ahead, he's a prophet, and spoke of the resurrection of Mashiach, of the Christ, that he was neither abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh suffer decay, which is Peter quoting, by the way, what Psalm? Psalm 16. Psalm 16. That one should be in your back pocket. It's one the apostles use a lot. Right? So, he was abandoned to the abode of the dead. He didn't suffer decay. How come? Because this Jesus, not any other Jesus, not Jesus down the block, not Jesus around the corner, but Je this Jesus that I'm speaking of, this Jesus the Nazarene, this one who worked the miracles that you yourselves know and you're all impressed by, this Jesus, this Yeshua, God raised up again. Yeah, you saw him crucified. If you didn't see him, you heard he was crucified. You said, well, there goes another failed Messiah. Peter says, uh-uh, not so fast. This Yeshua, this Jesus, God raised up again, for which we are all witnesses, authenticated by the fact that we, yeah, Galileans mostly, are speaking in your own dialect. Therefore, having been exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, he has, Yeshua, has poured forth that which you both see and hear. Which will be very exciting to remember this passage when we get to uh, John chapter 7 in a few months, uh, uh, where Yeshua says, if you want the living water, come to me. Peter says, yes, what Jesus promised, he has done. He's poured forth that which you both see and hear. We're exhibit A, B, C, D, E, F, G, all the way to 12. And Peter said to them, here's the wrap-up. Here's the wrap-up, the conclusion. Repent, change your minds. About what? Change your attitudes. About what? About who Yeshua is. These are powerful words. They still speak to us today, don't they? Lots of people are like Nicodemus. Well, I'm sure that Jesus was a great prophet. I'm sure that Jesus was a great teacher. I'm sure that Jesus was uh, somebody worthy of respect, but I can't buy that he was the Messiah. There may be some of you out here like that who think that way. 
I, I, I certainly can't buy that he's deity, that he's somehow equal to God. Uh, it's too much. I can't buy it. Peter says, you don't have to buy it, it's free. Just accept it, or as John would say, receive it. And believe. Change your mind about who Yeshua is. And if anyone here today, if anyone here today, if anyone watching this, feels the sudden, unexpected urge to change their mind about who Yeshua is. Give in. That's the Spirit of God being poured out and prompting you to recognize the truth, to allow the scales, the blinders to fall away from your eyes so that you can see clearly at long last and be baptized, show allegiance, pledge allegiance to the authority of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ. Your sins will be forgiven. You will receive. When you believe, you will be born from above, anew, again, anothen. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh. And this promise is for you, Peter says, 2,000 years ago in the temple. And it's for your children, the progeny of those who are there in the temple. And it's also for those who are far off. It's for Jews. It's for non-Jews. Gentiles. It's for as many as the Lord your God, our God, will call to himself. We are the progeny of those who are far off, the Gentiles of that day. Somewhere, if you're a Gentile, somewhere you can trace your ancestry to the people that Peter was talking about. All, not some, not most, but all who are far off. And if you're Jewish, you trace your ancestry to the children of those whom Peter was addressing that morning. For as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And so the Lord our God is calling you today. You don't want to say no to that. I urge you, don't say no to that. Well, let's close here. Pentecost. Um, my Pentecost um, message generally ends with um, the acronym RIP, and I make a little joke. You'll hear it next year, I'm sure. Um, that God, uh, you may feel like God doesn't give a rip about you, but he gives a rip, he gives an RIP. But I'm going to tell you today, bringing John and John chapter 3 in to Pentecost and uniting them together, I'm going to tell you the truth is that God doesn't just give a rip, a single rip about you. He gives rips, multiple rips about you. He loves you and he cares about you. So I'll give you, four, not three, but i give you four. An extra one, no extra charge. Four reasons for the Spirit's indwelling. And the one, the first one, is that you have a relationship. A, relation, a personal relationship with the Creator of heavens and earth. The heaven and earth. You have a, creator with, uh, a relationship with your Creator, with the one who made you the one who has known you all your life, the one who has been with you, watching, comforting, caring, loving you, all your life. God is not far, far away, long, long time ago, in a different galaxy. 
He's not watching you like the old Bette Midler song from 30 years ago. From a distance. God is with you now. Through the Spirit of God, through through the means of the Mashiach, of the Messiah, we have a relationship with the one who was far off but has now been brought near. How near? Closer than the very air we breathe. We have an intercessor. You know, high priest, we talk, we've, we've gone through Leviticus, we've gone through Exodus, we, we we're starting the numbers in our uh, Torah cycle. Priesthood, very, very important. But the average Israelite, in fact, every Israelite, every single Israelite except the high priest, they only knew that God was there in the Holy of Holies. Then you could see him. I didn't get up close to them. The high priest was the only one who got to in his presence. The high priest and the priesthood were the ones who interceded for them. But now we have a new high priest, not a Levitical high priest, a superior priesthood, a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek, the righteous king. That's our Messiah, Yeshua. And he doesn't retire he doesn't take a break. He doesn't go to sleep. He doesn't go on vacation. He lives to make intercession for you. And he especially lives to make intercession for you. We therefore can approach the throne of grace boldly. And with courage, casting all our cares before him because he cares for us. Why? Because we, through the Spirit, have a supernatural birth. We have been born again. We have born, been born anew because we are born from above. Don't expect the culture to understand you. Don't expect the culture to go along with the fairy tale that you're living, right? This Jesus thing. Except we know it's no fairy tale. This is life and light and truth and love. And we receive it in one way and one way only. Through Yeshua, HaMashiach, Jesus our Messiah. Well, Chag Sameach, that's Pentecost. Mm-hmm.